Martin, welcome. Thank you a lot again for accepting our invitation. And uh, I'm sorry to hear that you had some troubles on the on the way to Brno. Uh, I don't know how to welcome your dog. <laughs> how do you how how you welcome a dog? Hello, Hello dog. <laughs> I don't know German, so I think he's just ignoring me. <laughs> um, Martin is a very is an extremely active activist. Um, I, I had the time to uh, search for his website a little bit, and I saw that he's very active also in his blogging and writing many many articles, many many, many interesting things. Um, he founded and created in uh, 1985 the first group and initiative of uh, animal rights in Austria, if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, in the last the last 20 years, he's working 20 years, right? He's working in. Uh, in the organization called, I will try it in German, uh, Verein gegen Tierfabriken. <laughs> I had to practice that at home. <laughs> and he will be talking actually about all the all the successes and all the uh, achievements they uh, they had in this organization because they oh hello uh, because they uh, they had a lot of uh, successful campaigns and I think. Uh, I think uh, it's a big inspiration for us in the Czech Republic because I think animal rights are quite behind uh, in that aspect. And uh, I don't know if you know, we do also have in Sechnuti one initiative fighting for the animal uh, rights and uh, I think it will be very inspiring also for us to hear your good practices and how you make uh, this topic successful in Austria. Thank you, thank you for having me here. Um, yes, there were successes in Austria, but there's also now a big shift in the society, I think worldwide, and this is for me the main issue, a main issue I want to address actually today as well. And this is a move to a more authoritarian system. And this more authoritarian system shrinks the space for our activism in all social justice movements. This is why I think it's time to sort of come closer, the different movements coming together and actually um, defending our space for activism. Um, I've been active, as has been said, for more than three decades and I can, um, <clears throat> I can uh, say from my experience that there has been a real change. Um, 30 years ago there were some big radical actions and there was this radical atmosphere, and there was a revolutionary spirit, and, and then came ever more um, suppression and repression of, uh, of activism and more restrictive laws, and also um, the, the atmosphere in society changed. Um, <clears throat> in the last three decades, there was um, a spreading between the poor side of society and the rich. The rich were ever getting richer, and the big companies were ever getting more influential politically. And the consequence is that they don't want a disruption of the atmosphere of consumerism. And um, they consider our activism such a disruption. And this is why they began to curb it. And the reaction of the movements, plural, not just the animal movement in my view, was that um, we let us sort of move in the direction that they would rather appreciate, which is um, what I call positive campaigning. This is speaking one-to-one -to, -one to people, persuading them of good ideas, be it veganism, be it better animal welfare laws, and just, <clears throat> just speaking with people, but always being nice and friendly and never challenging the system. And this happens now, seems to me, all over the place, that this sort of radical edge, the, the confrontational campaigns, confrontational activism has um, shrunk. And um, there is also, maybe you know them, maybe they have been here, even Melanie Joy and Tobias uh, Leonard, who are giving these lectures all over the place on how to do effective campaigning for animals. And they <coughs> have two-day course on how to be very, very friendly to everybody, never be too intrusive, never show two ugly pictures, never disrupt their uh, sort of emotional state and try just to, to persuade them. But does that work? Does it work to challenge a system by persuasion? 
I have um, <clears throat> here a picture of such a persuasive effort coming when it comes to releasing pheasants for shooting. Um, there's also the option of um, sort of um, investigating factory farms. These are the pig, also the blue spots are pig factories in Austria, and this is the, the yellow flags are those that we have filmed and made public and uh, showed the pictures of, and um, showing those pictures then on the streets. And this <coughs> might be slightly disruptive, but it is um, work that goes towards persuading people to change their mind. But people who have changed their mind not necessarily, necessarily change their behavior. And if they don't change their behavior, the system keeps on rolling on as it always did. <coughs> One example, considering vegan campaigning. In 1999, we founded the Vegan Society and did a lot of vegan outreach. And you see, this is the meat consumption um, per head, per year in Austria, that it is relatively the same all the time. And uh, there's new figures here for 2016 now, but it, it uh, more or less stays the same. Why is that? There are more people who, are, who have changed their attitude towards animals. That's definitely the case. I've been going into schools, um, I've been talking to every new generation and they have changed their attitude, but they haven't changed their behavior. And I show that with this, with this curve. Um, this, this is the curve and consider it to be a surface on, on, the, on the earth. And we humans are balls on this surface. And this extends from the left most, which is um, the most kind of animal abuse you can have, and you can have that with all different aspects of, of social justice movements, you can have the most abuse of humans, and then to the right there's the most respect towards um, animals in that case. So here you have animal torture for fun, the organization of animal fights like dog fighting, cock fighting, bull fighting, and here you have veganism on the other side, complete respect towards animals and <coughs> liberation. And um, society now bends this curve in certain way and this is what I call the system in society and this bending um, has an effect on the balls that are rolling on this surface, us and the steepness of this curve um, is essentially what drives, what drives um, people to what is happening um, consider yourself to be somebody who is organizing animal fights like you're organizing dog fights and um, <clears throat> it is illegal and it is socially not accepted. So in order to do that, you always have to look if police is already coming, if the animal rights people are seeing you, if your friends realize that you're actually um, uh, organizing animal fights. And that is why this is so steep here. There is a pressure to go towards more respect towards animals. The system pressurizes people who organize animal fights to be more respectful towards animals. They might not have changed their opinion, but they change their behavior because the system pressurizes to, to them to do it. The most comfortable position, there where the ball is lying without any energy, just uh, still, is um, what everybody else does. And this is, in our case, consuming factory farmed animal products, consuming typical vivisection products behaving like everybody else. Going through the supermarket, supermarket, grabbing the products that are in your head, uh, height, and they are the cheapest, um, and taking in what everybody else does. <clears throat> this is something you do without effort. You're just going with the flow. If you move towards more respect towards animals, there's again a steep gradient here, like moving towards organic meat. That would mean you have to look what you're eating. Consider yourself uh, to have been on a, maybe an ice hockey match with your friends and then you come out and you chat with them and they go and eat something. And you're with your friends and you want to eat organic meat only. And almost no place has that. And if they have it, um, you have to look through the, the card um, to find it actually. So you have to be difficult. And all your friends are with you and they look at you and ask, why is it so difficult? Why can't you eat like everybody else? And you immediately feel this pressure. I want to be like everybody else. I don't want people pointing at me. And this is why it's so steep here, because it's pretty hard to eat organic meat only. It constantly moves you down there. And if you're spirited and motivated enough to actually stay there, 
then you will see that it, 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 it consumes energy. You all the time have to have to work against the flow. It's not easy to do that. And if you move up from organic meat to vegetarianism or veganism, it gets a bit flatter, I find, because from organic meat to vegetarianism, the step is much shorter. There's less, less effort change, but still it drags you down all the time. And if there is somebody now doing this outreach to you, giving you a leaflet, and, look, and, they, and you look at it and say, wow, it's true, animals are being abused, I shouldn't eat them, um, I want to be vegetarian, say, then you move yourself up here because you've received that leaflet in this positive campaigning outreach. And then you stay staying there, here up, the, up um, against the flow. And maybe you are strong enough to stay there for a while. There's this constant drag on you, but you still do it. And then something major happens in your life. Um, life change, you lose your job, say, and then you wonder. Um, <coughs> You have different priorities. You have to look for another job. You have little money. And suddenly you will see you will fall down the trough again into this minimum. Because the system just constantly drags you down there. People are social animals. People want to be like everybody else. They want, don't want to stick out. And they are not rational animals. So if you give them the best rational argument why the system is faulty, they will say yes and behave like the system um, moves them to behave. This is how humans are. So this outreach thing has an effect, it makes people aware, it may, maybe changes minds, but it doesn't change the system and it doesn't change um, the behavior of people. And this is why the corporate side of our society loves this kind of activity. They, they happily tell you you have um, free, you, you, free speech, you can give your opinion, as long as you do it friendly, as long as you have a friendly leaflet, as long as you haven't got shocking pictures, as long as the mood, the general consumerist mood, isn't disrupted. So this is this is so this is what this suggestion you strongly feel. And indeed, um, the reaction of our movement and other movements was to just do it like that because it's a comfortable niche, a comfortable corner to be in. Um, they are happy with you, and you are. Um, <clears throat> And you, you sort of feel that you change the system. But as a matter of fact, I argue, you don't actually do that. You change people's minds. There's a number of campaigns running now in the animal movement who um, do something like that. Um, so cooperating with, with um, the, the political enemy, if you want. There's the safe system where the people go to um, slaughterhouses and they actually talk with the slaughterhouse owner and say, is it okay for you if we stand there, we will be really friendly. We just want to see the animals briefly before they go in, we want to stroke them briefly. And then they arrange each other and go even drink some tea and coffee and stay there. Um, and this is um, the safe actions that are now spreading across the world. And <clears throat> yeah, I wonder if those who keep slaughtering animals on the ground scale are not disrupted by you and not appalled by what you do, how can it possibly change the system? How can it change their behavior? Um, I had this workshop on constructive communication at our group, um, effective communication, where you sort of have non-violent communication. It's really good, especially it's good if amongst uh, you, so, don't, uh, so that you cooperate well. And also, if there are two people who actually want to create harmony, amongst them or groups and, um, and want to cooperate. But if we are protesting like against the fur shop, we don't want harmony. If the fur shop owner and I uh, communicate non-violently and she's happy with me staying there, then I've done something wrong in my view. Because my aim is that she has to close down her shop, that the, that the sale of fur is not acceptable and actually eventually disappears. And this is why I would argue that we also need to um, do this uh, campaigning for, um, for system changes that are actually um, driven by confrontations. Um, the problem is polit politicians, in my experience of really three and a half decades, and many other people's maybe as well, is that politicians who have achieved a certain status in, in a society, a certain powerful position, are not ethically motivated. They haven't gone there in order to make society a better place. Because if you're so, so well-minded, then you haven't got the elbow tactic and the, 
and the brutality to actually get to the top. Only people who push others aside get to the top and push themselves in the front. So politicians are generally, if they are in power, my experience, people who want to keep the system as it is in order to be re-elected. And they don't care much what the system actually is. And um, <clears throat> so basically, if you start disrupting um, the system and shaking it, then they will say to you, stop doing it. And they will possibly send you the police and they will try to bring in draconian laws. And, um, and uh, they, they don't like it. So essentially what this, uh, this um, campaign strategy suggests is that we disrupt the system so much that they cannot go on like before, but that they have to stop and listen and come and talk with us and arrange a new dynamic equilibrium, as I call it, a new system. The idea is that we move that trough to the right. We change the system like the sales of cage eggs. Um, there is now a campaign, uh, a worldwide um, new, since 2016, a new campaign coalition called the Open Ring Alliance. And they, um, they do confrontational campaigns against companies who sell or use cage eggs, so eggs from caged hens. Um, and you could say this is something like organic meat. This is a free range, free range um, animal product, maybe even vegetarianism, organic vegetarianism. Um, so this is here. And, um, and essentially they, what, what the normal people do, what most people do is use caged eggs. Um, because this is what's in every product and what's always the cheapest and what's the easiest to reach in the supermarket and what everybody else does. So these groups, and there are 54 groups, come together in a coalition and um, in six different continents on the world. They try now to persuade companies to stop selling caged eggs products. And if they all stop selling it, then everybody will not buy it. And even without changing people's minds, the trough will have moved here and those who don't care actually don't eat caged eggs anymore. So this is a chance to move the whole of society by a confrontational campaign. And if you, uh, if you ask me, does that work, then I say, yes, it does. We have a number of such examples where it did work. And does it lead to repercussions from the state? Yes, it does. The state and the companies obviously don't like it because the production costs are more expensive and um, they fear the competition of others who still use caged eggs. At the moment, this campaign is running against Starbucks in order to get the worldwide Starbucks to actually stop using caged eggs. And it seems to work. The list that the Open Wing Alliance has of, non, of cage free companies is uh, growing continuously. We have actually done a number of such campaigns as well. In the years 1996 till 2002, we have, for example, um, banned, got a ban in Austria on wild animal circuses. So circuses that use animals that are not domesticated, like horse, um, camel or dogs, um, but exotic animals like um, lions, tigers and, and elephants. And this ban came into effect on the 1st of January 2005. And what that meant is it moved the trough because if in Austria you want to go to a circus, you automatically go to one that hasn't got exotic animals. Sure, we did for years explain it to people and try to win their minds. But they still did go in those circuses and it's easy to understand why. Because the circus was in town, the child says, look, there's a circus, I want to go there. Then they said, now nah, let's do something else. Nah, then I'm crying, you must go with me. Um, other people go with you, so people go. And it doesn't take many people to keep these circuses alive. So um, essentially the circuses were still there and they were still rolling on until we got a ban on them so that um, foreign circuses couldn't come in and Austrian circuses weren't allowed to exist. And the consequence is that everybody, 100% of society, is actually going only into circuses with um, with domesticated animals, who you could keep easily much better and also have a better personal relationship. You don't need to cage them. And so it's uh, from an animal welfare perspective, uh, certainly a, a, a much better, um, much more respect towards those animals. So it's far further to the right here. Um, another example would be the ban on fur farms, which is also happening here in the Czech Republic now. Um, 
if the fur farm ban goes through, then nobody can produce fur. And then we hope that we can drive companies out of it. The city of Vienna is now bringing in a law that bans the sales of fur on public markets. So more and more we're driving fur out, and that means the trough is moving to the right. People are against fur, but they still buy it because they buy it on these little um, accessories, on the, on the hats of, of woolly hats with a little fur pole and so on. They keep buying it because it's cheap, because it's there, because they're not informed. And so um, the system actually gets them buying it. And if we may move the system, then they stop buying it. Um, so essentially, I find it vital to actually um, to actually have such a confront confrontational campaign. I want to show you now. Essentially, democracy, a living, live, alive democracy, is one where there is conflict. Conflict is a natural and necessary ingredient of democracy. Democracy doesn't mean everybody is um, not arguing about anything. Um, it must be a constructive conflict. This is the essential point of, of these confrontational campaigns. They are not forcing others by threat of violence or violence, but um, this is um, <coughs> a way of raising trouble in society. I keep thinking of a little boat and you start shaking the boat so that people don't comfortably sit in it but say, what is the matter here? We need to find a new solution. And, um, and after a constructive conflict, there is a dynamic equilibrium of a certain system. This is the status quo where at that moment everybody is agreeing with and say, this is a way we accept. Um, the system to be. This is the idea of a democracy. And if somebody starts, or a subgroup starts to be not um, happy about this situation, then they start shaking the boat again, and a new equilibrium must be found. The problem is that for animals and other issues like climate and environment, there is no um, electoral representative of those interests. So we must shake the boat uh, on their behalf, on the behalf of animals. And this is why it's <coughs> sort of a bit problematic. <coughs> the idea is to, to escalate the conflict. The first thing that happens is that the powerful try to ignore you. They try to pretend that you are not actually doing anything. And they will keep telling you, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. Um, when you manage to raise the conflict further, then they will try to repress you. They will try to send you to police or give you some public order offenses or maybe sue you in court. And if you've overcome that hurdle, then they start um, being able to, uh, being prepared to talk with you and come up with a new compromise. And then the trough potentially moves to the right. Is that, how can that fit to democracy? democracy um, is something where you just vote, and if you have voted, this is this um, a, a bit naive idea, if you have voted, then um, there is a majority opinion, and this is the, how the system is, and you have to accept it. As a good democratic person, you have to accept it. But um, we are not in an ideal democracy. In our democracy, the companies and the powerful, influential uh, economic elites influence um, the system so much so that it's not majority opinion. Um, we see that in many animal issues, like um, factory farming. If you ask people, the majority will be against many types of factory farming and possibly all. Um, it's still the factory farming system is running unchallenged. So how can that fit within democracy? It's easy because the, the companies have um, a an very unfair influence. They, are always being the first ones who are being approached by politicians um, on their opinion. They're always warned if there is a change looming. They have large budgets. There's one, one uh, very um, rich person who can afford uh, pasting the whole city with their placards and pressing their opinion on you. 
but we haven't got that money, so we have to stand on the road and, and uh, hand out leaflets in comparison. So there's one person who's actually supposed to be one vote only, who is influencing um, the society much more than is due to them in an ideal society. And also, the treatment of animals especially, and other corporate secrets of how they poison the environment, this is always kept as a secret, um, and if you haven't got access to that, you can't have a decent majority opinion on it. And so, my argument is that it is democratically legitimate to break the law in certain ways um, to, to balance out this, um, this um, in, um, unevenness. A large budget, for example, you can do a public order um, event like a disruption or um, a graffiti that um, sp uh, spreads the message as well. Um, just because you haven't paid for it doesn't mean it's democratically not legitimate. Um, so that the media reports on it and there is a public debate on it. Anything that furthers the public debate, the open debate, um, is, is uh, democratically legitimate, even if it's illegal. Um, also, the political influence, like politicians never listen to you. If you ask them, can you talk with me, they ignore you. But they immediately go to the big company and do exactly as they want. So, in, in, uh, as a, to even that out, we can occupy their office, we can blockade their work and force them, in that sense, with the public opinion behind us, to actually um, agree or, or negotiate a new uh, system. And also do investigations in animal factories or beef section laboratories in order to release that to the public, because the public has a right to know. Here's now a few examples of such actions. Um, this is a disruption action of an animal fight in 1998, it was allowed to have ram fighting in Austria, and we disrupted these fights in order to have a public debate on it. Um, fur show, there were lots and lots of fur shows in the end of the 1990s and beginning of 2000s in, in Austria and Vienna, especially there was five days fur show events in the city hall, and we started disrupting every single such fur fashion show. Here are the fur models, and people jump on the stage and say this is what really um, the fur really looks like if you look at it. This is the animals from where the fur is coming from. Um, <clears throat> this is um, a minister for animal welfare and she wanted to um, allow uh, songbird trapping. 40,000 songbirds were supposed to be trapped and, and used as, um, as pets. And so we wanted to talk with her, she didn't, so we disrupted her public speeches by saying um, she allows this sort of practice. And this is um, the agricultural minister doing a press conference, and we disrupted that by showing uh, pictures of uh, sow stoles that he is allowing, and we had a campaign to get these sow stoles banned, which actually worked at the end. But um, this is a, a way of getting a public debate on this issue, even if it's uh, illegal. Um, fly posting, graffiti, um, here on the motorway sign, also to spread the word. Occupation blockade, here we blockaded the agricultural ministry for 33 hours with these um, lock-on pipes. This is the doors, we closed them, five doors and two um, drive-ins we, we locked. Um, for 33 hours in order to open up the debate on south doors. This is a tripod blockade of one of the entrances. And um, this is the provincial governor's office. Um, she allowed um, a certain pig factory um, keeping animals by chaining them to the floor. This is the early 2000s. And we wanted to stop her. She didn't talk with us. Then we occupied her office, locked on together with d locks in the office floor and actually forced her to talk with us, which uh, ended um, with this, this ban uh, taking effect and investigations as well. <clears throat> um, there is obviously also a, a non-legitimate um, way of confrontational activity and that is um, threats of violence, use of violence, because it closes the open debate. If you're threatened and then you don't dare um, give your opinion, then it closes the space of debate, and that's where democracy ends. Even if you say it's ethically justified, because I'm only using a threat of violence to stop violence against somebody else, it is 
um, like animal um, slaughter, it is um, democratically um, illegitimate and you, you leave democracy. And the same if you use violence or you do criminal damage in order to exert pressure. Um, and that's very important to keep the, here a, a borderline where you don't cross it into this kind of activity because democracy is a high value, very high value. We cannot participate in society um, in, in forming and shaping the system if we don't um, have that space to do it. And if we were to use this kind of activity, then um, the police repression would be justified within the system and would stop it completely and would also stop the whole um, idea, um, ideas that we are actually promoting. So um, this is, by the way, an example of an um, illegal criminal activity that I find democratically legitimate. Here I went into a bird factory farm, a caged factory farm, and, um, and liberated seven hens to the value of 15 euro and then went to court for it in order to spread the word about it and have a public debate on it. And um, it did work, I was convicted in the first instance and then I was um, found uh, not guilty on appeal because the judge felt that I had acted in the name of society doing this. So there is um, there's an acceptance of that kind and it had that kind of activity. It has, an, it has a tradition um, starting from Mahatma Gandhi, um, maybe uh, also via Martin Luther King, this activity in the southern states of the United States of America um, in the 1950s and 1960s was exactly that kind of activity. Martin Luther King managed to do eight campaigns for the liberation um, of uh, black people there and uh, until he was killed and he was the most hated person in the, in the USA at that time and he was also wanted by the FBI and locked up in prison um, ever so often, only short periods though. But um, he won at the end of the day his kind of campaigns which were uh, for black people to be allowed to go into the bus and to use the Mensa in the, in the universities. And he did that with as much disruption as possible. He very clearly says in his uh, writings that in order to change the system you must cause trouble um, to be listened to and to um, arrange a new, um, a new system where this suppression doesn't happen. And so he, he went deliberately with his um, followers, with his activists uh, during those days where the most trade was happening into those shops to disrupt them and have sit-downs and sit-ins and kneel-ins and run-ins and this kind of activity. So. Um, so this kind of thing has a tradition, but as I say, I feel that it's, um, um, that it's getting harder these days to do this kind of activity because, um, because um, the powerful get more politically influential and they don't want this kind of activity. Um, this is aspects of an illegal um, direct action that I find democratically legitimate. It must be part of a mostly legal campaign. Um, it is an escalation where you come um, to ever more radical action because the opponents don't listen. Um, and then you start with this kind of illegal activity. No threatening and damage minimized. When I liberated those chickens, I did do criminal damage. I had to cut the lock, but I actually replaced the lock and I left the lock there so that they can use it. So that uh, it was a symbol for me uh, to, to give them the message that I'm actually not there to um, damage their property. I'm there to um, make, the pu uh, make the plight of the animals public. Essentially what we see when we do this activity is that the more radical the action is, the more effective it is. Um, but that only up to a point. There is a point where the more radicality leads to a complete breakdown of effectivity. Um, um, and it comes, to, it comes to naught, essentially. And that's because this is the point where the public turns against you. This is the point where the public thinks you're only troublemakers. Uh, the more radical you are, the more um, public reaction there is on what you do. 
and then here suddenly um, the, pub the public considers you a threat to social security and considers it good if the uh, authorities follow you um, and dis destroy your group. Um, <clears throat> So here's mainstream activity, this is being nice and friendly, always a um, friendly face, friendly uh, leaflet, uh, never um, disruptive pictures. Um, this is also where you get most donations if you want to start a group and get high donations. Um, this is the most effective radical action where you come close to the tipping point and this is um, an ineffective radical action. And it is important to realize that the tipping point is not cast in stone, but it actually moves. If you have less sympathy of the public, then the tipping point is far earlier. And if you have more sympathy of the public, then the tipping point is far more, far more to, the, to the radical end. In order to, to make that understandable an example, if you uh, campaign against uh, these battery farms for egg-laying hens in the cages, and nobody knows what that is, and everybody consumes it, then you won't be able to do very radical actions because people just don't understand at all what you're on about and just uh, think you're the nuisance. So essentially, first you have to just spread the word and make people understand and make people empathize with those animals and say, yes, this is something that shouldn't happen and I actually don't want to eat those eggs. Um, the more that works, the more this thing moves to the right. And the louder you can protest, and the people will say, yes, it's justified to protest so loud, because it's really an awful situation. Um, and then if you manage to um, make it clear that the politicians, and maybe these big, rich companies, are standing in the way of change, and they actually op openly don't listen to you and turn the back to you, then the public will slowly get outraged about them. And they will say, how can they do this? These people are elected, they're responsible, and they don't act. And then you can occupy their office because people say, surely you have to occupy these people's office because they're acting outrageously. So you see, the tipping point, the further you come, the more understanding you have by the public, the further to the right the tipping point is moving, and the more radical your action can be so that you have the sympathy of the public and you are effective and you are sort of protected from repression. And then, essentially, the campaign develops by moving that tipping point always staying close to the edge. This is the, um, uh, the, the art of effective campaigning, is sniffing out where the tipping point is and always just about staying to the left of the tipping point. And then moving the tipping point so far to the right that your, the radicality of your action is uh, pro producing so much public pressure that the, um, <coughs> that the politicians actually have to listen and eventually agree to a new compromise. And um, <clears throat> to finish, I had here a number of... Um, Yeah, with this kind of activity, we had a number of successes. Um, it started out with um, the, that's the last slide. Started out with the fur farm ban in 1998. Before that, we were actually a bit too timid. We didn't think we had the self-assurance to be able to manage law changes. We were just a small group. How can that work? But it actually did work. Um, the most radical action at the end was the occupation of the office of the governor, who was actually behind those um, uh, those fur farms and after five hours of um, being locked on in his office he actually agreed to talk with me and seven days later the fur farm ban was complete and at the end of November 1998 the last Austrian fur farm closed. Then I told you about the ban on wild animal circuses um, this was a campaign from 1996 to 2002 and the ban came in with a three-year transition phase, so on the 1st January 2005, we had no wild animal services left. Um, in 2003, we started the battery farm campaign. Um, 
the first major action was already this liberation. We felt it was good to have a big splashy action at the beginning so that everybody knows about this campaign. And then um, within a bit more than a year, we had the government agreed to a ban, also on the rich cages that are now the standard in the EU. Um, on the 27th of May uh, 2004, a unanimous decision, every single MP in our parliament voted for a ban on caging hens. Um, in 2006, we got a ban on the ex all experiments on apes. In 2007, this was a nine-month period from the beginning of investigating rabbit farming to a ban um, that um, was agreed on um, by the um, <coughs> government and by the, by the parliament and on the 1st January 2012, since then, we have um, it's no rabbit in a cage anymore, apart from vivisection rabbits, actually. Um, in, then we did the campaign on a ban on pig crates, but um, this ban was eventually agreed on, but it comes effect, uh, takes effect in 2033, so more than 20 years later, which shows also the kind of strategy that the opposition is using against this activity. Um, we got 2013 animal protection into the constitution and um, now we are running this hunting um, ban on hunting great animals, hunting in an enclosure and releasing great animals like pheasants and partridges um, into the hunting territory in order to shoot them, which is happening on a large scale in this country as well. I think there's millions actually here in Czech Republic of that kind of hunting. And uh, it took us three years and now the ban is essentially in place. There is two provinces who are still a bit wobbly. The, the law is there, it needs to be decided. It needs to be, it needs to be enacted actually. But um, <clears throat> you can also see when you follow those campaigns how the, um, how the opposition was getting organized. Um, in our campaign here, at the end, um, in this, this hunting campaign, all politicians always were prepared to meet and were saying, I agree with you. And that is strange because it stops you from escalating the campaign if this guy is prepared to meet you. And if he tells you, you are right, we're going to do this, what, what are you then doing? And then he's doing nothing, just sitting it out. So, so this is a new strategy, you have to think about how, how you can go around this one. But um, another strategy they developed was that they had an account, a bank account, where all the animal abusers paid in. And they used this account to start suing me, um, me especially, and others from the group for libel. Every time I mention a hunter, they start suing me. That's um, uh, an insult. Um, <clears throat> they had, there were 35 such trials against me, 25 running consecutively. And um, the first 18 I won, but then you always find a judge who is agreeing with these hunters. And they, uh, so I, I lost some as well. And that is always very threatening because um, you win 35 and, and they have enough money to run those trials, but you lose one and there's a huge amount of money that it costs you. Um, so luckily we had a bit of, a, of a, a public appeal and got some donations in, but still, um, at least I say if it's developed that far, you have to be prepared to fight in court against this permanent pressure that they put up on you also um, potentially attacking you physically, that happened in this campaign as well. And, um, and obviously the repression in 2008, I'm not sure you are aware of this because it's already 10 years ago, but for us that was a very big deal in 2008. We just had uh, finished this cage rabbit ban. Um, the, somebody in the government, in the police ministry, decided to start a special commission of police against us and they sent us spies, there were two spies in our group, one of them 18 months and the other one six months. And this was police, undercover police officers who were just going out with me, actually doing graffiti in the night. And um, I went with one of them into a battery farm filming the chickens there. And uh, they, they wrote their report and gave it to police. And then uh, one night, this was uh, just now actually, 10 years ago, 21st of May 2008, they smashed in the door and stormed in in the, in the night um, the police with a covered face, black face, helmet, shotgun and a flashlight and, and took me out of the bed. And they did that with 23 other people at the same time. Um, they also went in our office, um, took everything out in the night 
and carried it away with two lorries standing outside. Yes, and then there was um, a big trial against us for um, <coughs> forming a criminal organization to influence the uh, politics um, <coughs> uh, by coercion. And this trial was very exhausting. It was never based on anything real. These two police were actually our best witnesses because they, they said we did exactly what I, what I showed to you now, never threat, never criminal damage, but always within this democratically legitimate activity. And eventually, after a 14-month trial, um, the judge agreed. And in May, again now, for seven years ago, May 2011, we were all found not guilty. And so you say, the, you might say the state the justice system worked. Eventually, they agreed what we do is okay, so we can do it again. But um, that long pressure, I was for 105 days in the prison cell, um, on remand, waiting for the trial. Um, this pressure on you, being attacked in the night, um, this um, led to the consequence that most people who are involved as victims in this trial actually have stopped being active, which one can understand. I think. It's only a minority who are, still, who are still active and still doing this. So the state um, is actually prepared to go quite long lengths to, to shock you out of activity. Um, and that I won, or we won the trial at the end of the day, meant still we had the costs for defending ourselves. Um, I had to um, have 14 expert statements, I had two detectives that I paid for finding out who these uh, police spies were and so that I could get them in court. Eventually they were sitting in court with a stupid wig and a mask and saying uh, uh, everything was okay, what we did actually. But uh, the police um, wanted to avoid them going to court, so they hid their activity, but with detectives um, we found them out and we got them into court. Both of them were eventually witnesses in our favor. Um, but all these costs stayed with me. The government never refunded these costs. Although I was found not guilty, the Supreme Court of Austria ruled just four months ago that I am responsible for those costs because the way I acted, I made myself look suspicious and so the state was justified to chase me. And that is 600,000 euro. I have now debts of 600,000 euro for being active. So <laughs> there's a bad point to end, actually. <laughs> so if you do what I say, then you end up in a prison. <laughs> no, but um, it is vital not to let them scare us away, I find, which is why I'm still standing here. Um, it's vital to keep that space of activity, that democratically legitimate space of civil disobedience in order to be able to have a voice, a majority voice. In a democracy, the majority should rule. And if the government and these big industries just silence us by allowing us at best to distribute leaflets but not to do anything more, we need the space to protest and to shake the boat so much that they eventually have to listen and negotiate a new deal.